I'm very pleased that I get to announce, uh, to introduce you tonight, our speaker. And I want to recognize our, uh, the, our donors who sponsored our speaker tonight, Jim and Sandy Narduli. So thank you so much for that. Um, so Dr. Naomi Wolf will be speaking tonight. And besides being a best-selling author, an, a columnist and a professor, she has the distinction that this crowd will appreciate. If you pull up her Wikipedia page in the very first line, um, <clears throat> designates her as a conspiracy theorist. So, <laughs> um, so um, if that wasn't enough, listen to this. She graduated from Yale University. She received her doctorate from Oxford. She's a co-founder and CEO of Daily Clout, which is a successful uh, civic tech company. And she's written for every major news outlet in the U.S. and many of them globally. Uh, she had f four opinion columns, including in The Guardian and The Sunday Times of London. <clears throat> a year ago, and I can't wait to hear, hear her tell about this. A year ago, uh, with Daily Clout COO Amy Kelly, Dr. Wolf started a crowdsource project with 3,500 medical and scientific experts. These experts included physicians, RNs, biostatisticians, medical fraud investigators, and research and lab scientists. These people, in a year and a half, they read through um, almost a half a million pages of documents that Pfizer was required to release by court order. The result of this project was they compiled 68 reports documenting the greatest crime against humanity <clears throat> in recorded history. Um, she's, she's published these reports in book format. It's called War Room Daily Clout Pfizer Documents Analysis Volunteers Reports. It's already sold out three printings. Um, when I looked for it on Amazon, it's only available in Kindle uh, from Amazon, but it's been used already by courts, by members of European parliaments, by state and federal U.S. Senator, senators, teams of attorneys, and um, <clears throat> they've been using these and taking action to redress these harms and to just inform the public. Really heroic work. So how great is it that we now get to have an evening with Dr. Naomi Wolf? I welcome her. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the Mises Institute. And thank you so much to the Narduli family and to everyone who made this amazing evening happen and brought me here to meet a whole bunch of new friends and um, fellow warriors, it would appear. I knew that I was home <laughs> when I was having conversations over cocktails. And we would immediately start coming at something from two different opposite points of view and everyone perked up and looked livelier instead of getting tense and freaking out. <laughs> and I really knew I was home when the first line of my Wikipedia description, um, conspiracy theorist, was launched upon all of you and you burst into unanimous applause. So <laughs> I found my true brothers and sisters. And I guess <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to share a speech with you tonight that I've never given before. And it's also a really big day because I'm holding my book, which was just published, that I've never held before because this is the first time I've seen it. I mean, I'm just going to speak from the heart. And so the first part of my talk will be about the journey that brought me here <laughs> to you to be with my brothers and sisters in freedom um, because I didn't start here. And then I'm going to talk about what's in the Pfizer documents. Uh, so I'm just warning you that it's um, intriguing, then incredibly sad and distressing, but then I promise to end with inspiration. So I want to reassure you about this journey we're about to take together. Um, so I, many of you may not be familiar with me, uh, understandably, um, but I didn't start out hanging out with libertarians and, you know, Austrian economists. Um, I 
uh, came from deep, deep, deep in the world of liberal left-wing uh, kind of New York, Washington, I, I'll just say it, elites. Um, and the world of liberal Washington, New York legacy media, or also known as mainstream media. I didn't, I, I didn't start there. I came from a you know, very um, scruffy middle class background, but through education and I was a Rhodes Scholar and I wrote a bunch of bestsellers and I found myself a fixture for 35 years as kind of the media, a media darling on the left. I also, I will confess to you, because you are tolerant people, advised uh, Bill Clinton's re-election campaign and also was an advisor to Vice President Al Gore in his campaign for the presidency. So deep, deep, deep blue and deep, deep, deep kind of um, bubble, the bubble of where all those ideas and messages are, are incubated and propagated on the left. And I didn't know how wrong some of my ideas were. And you don't know that in that bubble because that bubble is so um, hegemonic and so uh, um, perfected in its self-referential, um, suffocating uh, reflection of itself eternally. It's a bubble without escape. A lot of metaphors there, but you understand. Then, when I was like a baby feminist, I must have been in my 20s, I had an interview with Lou Rockwell. And I'd never talked to a libertarian before. And this is an amazing archival document because in one, I don't know, half hour, 40 minute conversation, I literally, he literally, he didn't, he was very gentle. Uh, but he literally made me reconsider the foundational basis of my consciousness. And in this, in this interview, you can hear me rethinking and, and thinking, well, maybe, maybe there's a whole other world here about which I know nothing. And it's a world of freedom. And, it's, it, and especially I felt this incredible sense of um, anticipation that there was a universe of freedom, intellectual freedom, uh, social freedom, um, institutional freedom that I was glimpsing, that no one had ever showed me before. And it was intoxicating. Um, but, you know, the decades went on and I wasn't surrounded by people like that and I never, I never saw that glimpse again. Then the pandemic hit and, you know, I wrote a book in 2008 called The End of America in which I looked at history and identified what tyrants do, whether they're on the left or on the right, when they want to close down an open society. And they always do the same 10 things. They always take the same 10 steps. And I was seeing, starting in March of 2020, if I pace, does my audio go with me? Yes. Starting in March of 2020, I was seeing one, two, three, four, all these 10 steps locking together in a way that was utterly recognizable to me from studying Mussolini's Italy, Hitler's Germany, uh, you know, the, the countries behind the Iron Curtain during the 1950s, Argentina, China. This was classic totalitarianism, um, putting itself in place. And, and I was astonished because most people around me couldn't see it and didn't recognize it. But I knew perfectly well from having written The End of America, which the left cheered because it was written during the Bush era, so the bad guys were Republicans at that time. Um, I knew perfectly well that when my Democrat uh, governor, Andrew Cuomo in New York State, declared a state of emergency in June and said that we couldn't have more than six people in our homes at one time, that that was step 10. That's martial law, that's emergency law. There's no coming back historically from emergency law. So I started to do videos about this and, and about, you know, I don't know if you agree with me or not, it doesn't really matter because I'm among all of you, we get to disagree, which is the joy of it. But 
all of the many of the other elements of the pandemic and the reaction and the lockdowns and then the vaccine rollout were classic totalitarianism. Um, and, and I knew from having been a political consultant that the stories we were being told about, about everything were, were imaginary. And I wrote a book showing that they were imaginary, but I, I witnessed a massive transfer of wealth from the middle classes and the working classes to the rich as people went broke, not able to keep their businesses open, having to sell their properties that they saved for at fire sale prices. Um, I, I knew that children were being socialized, American children, children in Western Europe, children of free societies were being socialized to submit to, to get used to abject, um, groveling obedience and obedience to nonsense. And I knew that the science was bad. I run a company that produces um, access to government databases. And I knew that the COVID maps on the New York Times homepage, Johns Hopkins, all these major homepages were imaginary data because you couldn't see the data sets. There was so much wrong with it. Um, and I, I started to make the same arguments with, a, with what soon be, by November became a Democrat in charge that I had made when the Bush team was in charge, pointing out tyranny locking itself down all around us. And I, I began to be marginalized and ostracized by my own tribe. Because you're not supposed to criticize your own guy if you're on the left. Um, this all came to a head in June of 2021, when I noticed that women on social media were describing eyewitness accounts of having menstrual problems upon receiving mRNA injections. And three of my best sellers were about women's sexual or reproductive health. And I know you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You need eighth grade biology to know that that's a, a warning signal and that it's, a, it's going to affect fertility. And I tweeted something accurate about this. I was immediately deplatformed. And not only that, there was a global smear campaign coordinated. And that's where my Wikipedia page comes from, which changed overnight to conspiracy theorists. I, know, I now know AI can do this. I didn't at that time know that AI can change journalism around the world. Newspapers, uh, uh, networks where I'd been a fixture for three and a half decades. I was a non-person. They wouldn't talk to me. They Places I had columns, The Guardian, The Sunday Times of London, ran hit pieces on how I was now a QAnon sympathizer. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and they literally, I was a columnist for them. I mean, they literally had been seeking out my opinion, you know, since the 90s. So, so this was all very striking to me and very weird, but I knew that I had to keep reporting the threats to liberty and to humanity that I was seeing. Um, and so that changed my life. Uh, I got exiled overnight from my cozy perch as a liberal commentator. I got disinvited from all the galas. I was told I was no longer welcome. My friends broke up with me. Family members left me and my husband who was equally you know, unacceptably asking questions. Um, we were not allowed to come to the Thanksgiving table. Christmases were canceled. Um, it was very painful. But who became my new friends? Libertarians and conservatives. <laughs> and then I just want to share quickly some of the um, experience of having long-standing assumptions and beliefs that I thought formed the basis of my understanding of the world collapse and then get rebuilt in a different way because of my having these new conversations. I was um, invited by Jeffrey Tucker to be a fellow at AIER, which is a libertarian think tank. And I, I was like nervous. The, at that time, I still thought I was a liberal. And someone asked me a question about capitalism, and I gave my liberal answer. 
And I braced because I thought, okay, now I'll be frozen out or I'll be disinvited. No one will talk to me. And I remember this look of like open curiosity and a follow-up question, why, you know, why do you think that? And I thought, this is so surreal. We're not fighting. We're just ex exchanging civil views out of a, a desire to understand each other better. And I literally hadn't had that kind of conversation since the 70s on the left. I am not kidding. Um, I, you know, then many, many similar conversations uh, led me to re, you know, re-examine everything I believed. And I, for example, I remember the moment in which I realized that even capitalism at its worst, even a free market economy with all of its injustices and, you know, Dickensian horrors would give women more autonomy and self-direction and agency than a centrally planned economy. Amen. And like, I'd been a famous feminist for 35 years and had not figured that out or been allowed to figure it out, depending on your view. Um, January 6th, I realized to my horror that many of the things I was told about that were not true. I won't go into that now, but you know, many, many myths. And myths that were designed, I've got a, a, an essay called Dear Conservatives, I Apologize, because I realized that the myths about January 6th I was told were myths designed to demonize and otherize and present as violent uh, enemies of democracy half of this country. That was the intention of those lies. Um, all the way to the Second Amendment. I thought I hated guns. I thought I wanted gun control because everyone I knew around me in my lib liberal circles had to believe that. My husband is a former uh, US Army uh, Special Forces military intelligence guy. He's armed. And I remember when I went to buy a firearm with him for him to teach me to shoot. And I, and this young woman, she must have been 27, she showed me how she kept her firearm in a hip holster and, it, and then her blouse covered it. And I realized I've been working for rape survivors and victims of abuse and domestic violence who are women my whole adult life. You know, I'm a survivor myself. This could change everything for women. I mean, I could go on and on. I had to, I had to re-examine everything, but mostly I feel incredibly blessed. I don't call myself a conservative. I don't call myself a libertarian without reservations. I think what I am doesn't have a label. I think of myself as a constitutionalist, above all. But what I find so incredible, and I owe it all to this man and you know other friends, some of them are here, like Steve Berger, I now have a community of brothers and sisters across this country who believe all kinds of things. But what unites us more than anything is that we love this country and we believe in freedom and the Constitution. And we understand. <laughs> we understand that this is a time of great fundamental peril to the greatest nation that was ever conceived. Uh, and and it's been such a blessing to me to have brothers and sisters in the trenches fighting for this country and for humane values. And I do believe that even though we are few and diverse and motley, um, that the power of our uh, fellowship is holding off the worst of the darkness. So that's the first part of what I wanna say. Uh, now I'm going to go to the sadder part of my talk, as I warned you. Um, as uh, you heard, I oversee a project in which 3,250 experts um, united to read through the Pfizer documents. And another wonderful kind of a surprising partnership in history, Steve, when no one would talk to me, Steve Bannon called, right? And so I went on his podcast and the Pfizer documents were being released and he sort of prompted me to ask for experts to help read through them 
Journalistically, I was very worried because these documents are, A, so abundant. They were releasing 55,000 a month. There are now 450,000 documents. B, they're written so technically that it's very hard for a lay person to understand them. So Bannon prompted me to ask for experts to get together and issue, read through them. And, and I did. And amazingly, 3,250 of the most distinguished experts, scientific and medical experts, responded. And the amazing Amy Kelly, my COO and the project director, in ways that I can't understand, it seems like kind of miraculous, organized them into six working groups, and they have now issued 88 reports. And I've taught them to write the reports in language that anyone can understand. So you can see these reports on the upper right-hand corner of my new site, Daily Clout. You can see them in the book that was described to you. But what I'm sorry to tell you is that they do document the greatest crime against humanity in recorded history. And I don't say that lightly. I'm the granddaughter of a woman who lost nine brothers and sisters in the Holocaust. So it is, at scale, going to be greater than that. Um, some of the key points, very, very briefly. Uh, the Pfizer documents show that Pfizer knew by November of 2020 that the vaccine didn't work to stop infection with COVID. In fact, Pfizer's language is failure of efficacy and vaccine failure. And the number three side effect in the Pfizer documents of getting the injection is COVID. <laughs> so everything that followed, all the mandates, all the hysteria, all the ostracism, the two-tier society was based on a lie. Um, Pfizer knew, well, Pfizer, the spokespeople told you that the injection stays in the deltoid. That is a lie and they knew it. Uh, our Dr. Robert Chandler, a distinguished sports medicine physician who's treated the Angels and the Lakers, uh, saw in the Pfizer documents that they knew that it biodistributes the lipid nanoparticles, the spike protein, and the mRNA biodistribute throughout the human body in 48 hours and accumulate in the brain, which can help to explain some of the cognitive and personality changes some people have noticed in their mRNA vaccinated loved ones. They accumulate in the spleen, in the liver, in the adrenals. And if you're a woman, they accumulate in your ovaries. Now, lipid nanoparticles are an industrial fat, and they've been known for 10 years to cross every membrane in the human body. So you would wish that such a material would, that the body could excrete it. But what Pfizer knew, and their chart shows this, is that the the materials leave the deltoid like this, and then they accumulate in the ovaries and the other organs like that. And there's, our, our volunteers have found no mechanism whereby they leave the body. And that, what that means is, first injection, LNPs accumulate in your ovaries if you're a woman. The second injection, more lipid nanoparticles accumulate in your ovaries. Third injection, more accumulate in your ovaries. And what is being found now by nurses who are doing abdominal surgeries is uh, blocked uh, fallopian tubes. And Pfizer knew this. Um, Pfizer knew that, well, there are 42,000 plus adverse events in the Pfizer documents just three months. Uh, the number one category, interestingly, is arthritis type pain, joint pain. And if you consider so many people you know, probably certainly people I know have, knee replacements, hip replacements, shoulder replacements, healthy young people are having joint and arthritis problems. That's inflammation from the lipid nanoparticles. Um, there's, uh, at industrial scale, also uh, neurological events like Alzheimer's, dementias, Parkinson's, epilepsies, Guillain-Barre, Bell's palsy, stroke type events, um, huge numbers of blood clots, lung clots, leg clots, thrombocytopenia, uh, heart damage, uh, tachycardia, my myocarditis, pericarditis, and in just three months, 1,225 deaths. Half of the serious adverse events for stroke and liver damage took place within 48 hours 
after the injection. Um, the way that Pfizer got to tell the world that their injection was 95% effective, which you'll recall was what the spokespeople said at the rollout, was that they just removed 200 infected, vaccinated people from their math, leaving 95% uh, <laughs> people who were vaccinated. And in other words, they just got rid of 200 people out of 205 people. And that's how they did the math that said it's 95% effective. Um, I could go on at great length about the harms to adults in the Pfizer documents. I mean, one of the, well, I'll skip ahead. To me, what's most important because, you know, what I've just described, if, described affects people who are with us right now, but what's most important to me is what's, what's in the Pfizer documents relating to the next generation. And what is absolutely incontrovertible is that in the Pfizer documents, what is revealed is a massive program to sterilize humanity, and particularly to destroy women as reproductive and nursing beings. Um, I mentioned that I was deplatformed because I talked about menstrual harms. There's a chart in the Pfizer documents. It's just, as a woman, this is so chilling. It, there's a chart that has like multiple lines, and each line is some horrible thing that happens to a woman, that can happen to a woman's menses. And there are like 15,000 women in one line, 10,000 women in one line, 7,500 in one line. So it's like bleeding every day of your life, you know, hemorrhaging, uh, two periods a month, 10,000 women, no periods at all, meaning no babies, you know, 12,500 women. Um, Onset of menses at 10 upon injection, you know, multiple numbers of girls. Uh, women in their 80s, postmenopausal women bleeding, M multiple women. Um, you know, agonizing cramps, endometriosis, passing, I mean, things I won't even describe. But, but this is like, and again, I'm Jewish, this is Mengele type science documenting the suffering, the ruination of women. I mean, these are, these are not like, because it turns out now that all these studies are coming out showing I was right. And, but they're saying, oh, like menstrual, you know, symptoms. This is disabling, these are disabling conditions. And these are conditions that mean you can't be a good mom, you can't be a good worker, you can't be a good soldier, you can't be a good pilot, you are disabled. And they map up against Ed Dowd's, former BlackRock hedge fund manager Ed Dowd's independent data also from government data sets and insurance data sets showing that a million people are identifying themselves as disabled in America every month. And overwhelmingly the numbers are women. And that maps to what we found, which is 62 to 70% of the people who are disabled are women. And Pfizer identified 16% of those disabilities in women as, quote, reproductive disorders, end quote, their words. Pfizer um, knew that the lipid nanoparticles uh, don't just uh, block the fallopian tubes, they traverse the placenta. And Jim Thorpe and other independent midwives we've interviewed show that they're finding nettings of calcifications now around placentas of pregnant women so that the baby can't get food or oxygen. And midwives are confirming that the placentas are not growing sufficiently. I've actually seen pictures of these placentas. They're not normal placentas. And so they have to deliver the babies two months early. And also the maternal death rate has gone up by 40% because of hemorrhaging uh, from these impaired placentas. Not only that, Pfizer knew they were killing babies. There's a section in the Pfizer documents. Pfizer told women not to get pregnant in the trials. 270 of them got pregnant in any way. Pfizer lost the records of 234 of them, which is illegal. Uh, of the 36 they followed to term, 28 of the women lost their babies. 
There's another section of the Pfizer documents, which is a pregnancy and lactation report. In that report, they show two babies dying in utero. And the reason Pfizer gives in their own internal documents is, quote, maternal exposure to the vaccine. They knew it was killing babies in utero. They also knew in the same report that babies were dying from nursing vaccinated moms because the mRNA and the lipid nanoparticles uh, go into the breast milk. And lipid nanoparticles are covered in polyethylene glycol, which is a petroleum byproduct. And so tiny newborn babies, tiny babies are ingesting this as their only food. So there's another chart in the Pfizer documents in this report that shows, again, this many babies have tissue swelling from having nursed vaccinated moms. This many babies are vomiting. This many babies have fever. This many babies have convulsions. And at least one baby died from multi-system organ failure. So this chamber of horrors, this eight-page document, was completed in April of 2020. I'm sorry, in April 20th, 2021. It was sent to the White House and the CDC. On April 23rd, 2021, Dr. Rochelle Walensky held a White House press conference with this document in her possession, in which she told the women of America that there was no bad time to get the injection before you're pregnant, during your pregnancy, or after your pregnancy. It is safe and effective for pregnant women, she said. Actually, she said pregnant people. Safe and effective. She had this in her hand. They knew. This, this disease is supposed to be a respiratory infection. It's a respiratory infection. There's virtually nothing about the respiratory system in the Pfizer documents. Nothing about mucous membranes, nothing about nasal passages or lungs. It, there's a ton about sexuality and reproduction. Pfizer made it vaccinated male rats with unvaccinated female rats. Then they sacrificed the rats. Then they analyzed their sex, the, or, the cells of their sex organs. This is for a respiratory disease. Pfizer warned vaccinated men, this is hard to hear, not to have intercourse with, uh, with unvaccinated women of childbearing age without using two reliable forms of contraception. So there was something in the semen of vaccinated men that Pfizer knew could be damaging either to women or to the embryo. We don't know which it is. But there is that caution in the Pfizer documents. Pfizer defines, defines exposure to the vaccine as including skin contact and inhalation. You know, they knew that they, knew that they were impairing human reproduction. Amy Kelly found that the lipid nanoparticles degrade the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells of the testes uh, of baby boys in utero. And these are the uh, factories of masculine hormones, the hormones that switch on at male puberty to deepen the voice, broaden the shoulders, you know, have put hair on men's chest, that create what we think of as an adult man capable of fathering a child. So we don't even know what these little boys in utero are going to grow up to be, if they're even going to be men in the traditional sense, because their moms were vaccinated, because their moms were told that this was safe and effective, and they needed to take this to protect their babies. And now I'll just end this peroration. There's so much more. Well, this is important. Um, the White House held a, we have, we have volunteer lawyers. And one of our volunteer lawyers, Ed Berkovich, FOIAed, meaning Freedom of Information Act, the White House, to get every mention of myocarditis. And some whistleblower at the White House, uh, I'm sorry, the CDC released an extra 46 page document that Berkovich didn't ask for. And it's, a, it's an account of a complete freak out in May of 2021 a month after, before I was deplatformed, in which the White House was driving an emergency communication session with Dr. Walensky on CC, Dr. Collins on CC, Dr. Fauci on CC, to create a script with slides to deal with, quote, tough QA about COVID, end quote, uh, because they'd found out about massive numbers of 
blood clots, thrombotic thrombocytopenia, and heart damage, myocarditis. And instead of coming clean with the American people and saying this is causing heart damage and blood clots, we need to pull it off the market right away, we are so sorry, they doubled down. They created a script, which is 17 pages that are 100% redacted, and they rolled out that script for the rest of the year and to the present. And think of what happened then in 2021, knowing this injection was causing lethal forms of damage, they mandated it. They mandated our nurses, our doctors, our soldiers, our sailors, our pilots, our, our college students, knowing that they were injuring and killing people. Um, so the last thing I wanna say is unsurprisingly, two years after I was deplatformed for warning that women were having menstrual problems, Igor Chudov and others analyzing government data have found a 13 to 20% drop in live births around the world, but especially in the West. There are a million missing babies in Western Europe. I will also note that our Southern border is open. Again, I'm a daughter and granddaughter of immigrants. I believe in legal immigration, but what's, what's happening is a, a geopolitical attack on the West using population and the medical system. And the last thing I'll say is that I've concluded that this injection is a bioweapon. I've concluded it because of independent research I've done showing that uh, BioNTech, which is the subsidiary of Pfizer that produced the injections, has an MOU with the biggest CCP pharmaceutical company called Fosun Pharmaceuticals, which is run by senior Chinese Communist Party government officials. They were contracted to produce a billion doses. They were not for use in China. People in China take a different injection. They were exported. And China opened 14 manufacturing plants in Western Europe and two in the United States one in Andover, Massachusetts, and one in Princeton, New Jersey, to produce the Pfizer injection. They, um, the IP, according to the SEC, was transferred in 2021 to China. Not to a Chinese individual, not to a Chinese company, to China. And, uh, as, and if you look at the adverse events, of those 46,000 bad things that happened, 36,000 of them happen in the United States. Seven, the next largest tranche happen in Western Europe in order of political importance. Britain, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Greece, and all the 52 countries of the world combined amount to only 7,000 adverse events. And this is an injection that you can, you can modify its lethality um, very easily through temperature or through dosage with for instance, Pfizer's 30 micrograms being less than a third as lethal as Moderna's 100 micrograms. So that is my horrible, horrible, horrible update. I think that the CCP allied with globalists that you guys rightly don't like, uh, the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, non-government actors like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have united to create a new world order in which we're um, dead or disabled or sterilized. And people who are not used to liberty and don't know what it means to have human rights are, are flooded into the former bastions of democracy and human rights and a post-democratic, post-human rights world in which a bunch of oligarchs decide everyone's fate has been established. So that's what I have to share with you. I will close by saying it's people like you who will um, make that not happen. We can talk in the Q&A about how we can keep it from happening. It's already well underway. Uh, and I will close by saying witnessing all of this evil has led me to conclude, like I've studied history my whole life, and this is not normal human history. This is not normal human history Normal human history doesn't move in lockstep around the world in exactly the same way. 
This I've had to conclude, and also normal human history, there are like factions and betrayals and dissidents and you know rivals, and none of that is happening with this. I've had to conclude that this, there's something metaphysical at work here and that we're in literally a biblical time in which there is a battle between good and evil. And this is playing out on a material plane, but it's a manifestation of massive dark forces that really just hate humanity and that this is a test for humanity. And that literally I don't see survival. I'm not proselytizing. Just for me personally, I have become much more sure that I need God and that God is the way we're gonna get out of this and that we're not gonna get out of this without God. So that is, that is my conclusion, which I hope is hopeful be, because it means there's a way out of it. And I guess the, I always sort of end by saying, paraphrasing um, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, if my people who are called in my name will humble themselves and turn to me, then I will have mercy on them. I know I'm not getting this exactly word for word and heal their land. And I do believe that is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.